War Horse by Michael Morpurgo Chapter 19 But the war did not end. Instead, it seemed to move ever closer to us, and we heard once again the ominous rumble of gunfire. My convalescence was almost over now, and though still weak from my illness, I was already being used for light work around the veterinary hospital. I worked in a team of two, hauling hay and feed from the nearest station, or pulling the manure cart around the yard. I felt fresh and eager for work once more. My legs and shoulders filled out, and as the weeks passed I found I was able to work longer hours in the harness. Sergeant Thunder had detailed Albert to be with me whenever I was working, so that we were scarcely ever apart. But from time to time, Albert, like all the veterinary orderlies, would be dispatched to the front with the veterinary wagon to bring back the latest horse casualties, and then I would pine and fret my head over the stable door until I heard the echoing rumble of the wheels on the cobbles and saw his cheery wave as he came in under the archway and into the yard. In time I, too, went back to the war, back to the front line, back to the whine and roar of the shells that I had hoped I had left behind me forever. Fully recovered now, and the pride of Major Martin and his veterinary unit, I was often used as the lead horse in the tandem team that hauled the veterinary wagon back and forth to the front. But Albert was always with me, and so I was never afraid of the guns any more. Like Topthorn before him, he seemed to sense that I needed a continual reminder that he was with me and protecting me. His soft, gentle voice, his songs, and the whistling tunes held me steady as the shells came down. All the way there and back he would be talking to me, to reassure me. Sometimes it would be of the war. David says the Germans are about finished, he said, humming one summer's day, as we passed line upon line of infantry and cavalry going up to the front line. We were carrying an exhausted gray mare, a water carrier that had been rescued from the mud at the front. Almost knocked us out, they did, farther up the line, they say. But David says that that was their last grasp, that once those Yankees find their fighting legs, and if we stand firm, then it could all be over by Christmas. I hope he's right, Joey. He usually is. Got a lot of respect for what David says. Everyone has. And sometimes he would talk of home and of his girl up in the village. Maisie Brown, she's called Joey, works in the milking parlor up Ancy's farm, and she bakes bread. Oh, Joey, she breaks bread like you've never tasted before, and even Mother says her pastries are the, the tastiest in the parish. Father says she's too good for me, but he doesn't mean it. He says it's to please me, and she's got eyes, eyes as blue as cornflowers. Hair is gold as ripe corn, and her skin smells like honeysuckle, except when she first comes out of the dairy. I keep away from her then. I've told her all about you, Joey, and she was the only one, the only one that said I was right to come over here and find you. She didn't want me to go, don't think that. Cried her heart out at the station when I left, so she must love me a little, right? Come on, you old silly, you, say something. That's the only thing I've got against you, Joey. You're the best listener I've ever known, but I never know what the devil you're thinking. You just blink your eyes and wiggle those ears of yours from east to west and south to north. I wish you could talk, Joey. I really do. Then one evening there was terrible news from the front. News that Albert's friend David had been killed, along with the two horses that were hauling the veterinary wagon that day. A stray shell, Albert told me as he brought in the straw for my stable. That's what they said it was. One stray shell out of nowhere and he's gone. I'll miss him, Joey. We will both miss him, won't we? And he sat down in the straw in the corner of the stable. You know what he was, Joey? Before the war? He had a fruit cart in London, outside Convent Garden. Thought the world of you, Joey told me so often enough, and he looked after me, Joey, like a brother he was to me, 
Twenty years old. He had his whole life ahead of him, all wasted now because of one stray shell. He always told me, Joey, he'd say, at least if I go, there'll be no one that'll miss me. Only my cart. And I can't take that with me, and that's a pity. He was proud of his cart. Showed me a photo of himself standing by it. All painted it was, and piled high with fruit, and he was standing there with a smile like a banana spread across all his face. He looked up at me and brushed the tears from his cheeks. He spoke now through gritted teeth. There's just you and me left now, Joey. And I tell you, we're going to get home. Both of us. I'm going to ring that tenor bell again in the church. I'm going to eat my Maisie's bread and pastries, and I'm going to ride you down by the river again. David always said he was somehow sure that I'd get home. And he was right. I'm going to make him right. When the end of the war did come, it came swiftly, almost unexpectedly, it seemed, to the men around me. There was little joy, little celebration of victory, only a sense of profound relief that at last it was finished and done with. Albert left the happy cluster of men gathered together in the yard that cold November morning and strolled over to talk to me. Five minutes' time and it'll be finished, Joey. All over. The Germans have had about enough of it. And so have we. No one really wants to go on anymore. At eleven o'clock the guns will stop, and then that will be at that. Only wish that David could have been here to see it. Since David's death, Albert had not been himself. I had not seen him smile or joke, and he often fell into prolonged brooding silences when he was with me. There was no more singing, no more whistling. I tried all that I could to comfort him, resting my head on his shoulder and nickering gently to him, but he seemed quite inconsolable. Even the news that the war was finally ending brought no light back to his eyes. The bell in the clock tower over the gateway rang out eleven times, and the men shook one another solemnly by the hand or clapped each other on the back before returning to the stables. The fruits of victory were to prove bitter indeed for me, but to begin with, the end of the war changed little. The veterinary hospital operated as it always had done, and the flow of sick and injured horses seemed rather to increase than to diminish. From the yard gate we saw the unending columns of fighting men marching gauntly back to the railway stations, and we looked on as the tanks and guns and weapons rolled by on their way home. But we were left where we were. Like the other men, Albert was becoming impatient. Like them, he wanted only to get back home as quickly as possible. The morning parade took place as usual every morning in the center of the cobbled yard, followed by Major Martin's inspection of the horses and stables. But one dreary, drizzling morning, with the wet cobbles shining gray in the early morning light, Major Martin did not inspect the stables as usual. Sergeant Thunder stood the men at ease, and Major Martin announced the reembarkment plans for the unit. He was finishing his short speech. So we shall be at Victoria Station by six o'clock on Saturday evening, with any luck. Chances are, you'll all be home by Christmas. Permission to speak, sir, Sergeant Thunder ventured. Carry on, Sergeant. It's about the horses, sir, Sergeant Thunder said. I think the men would like to know what's going to happen with the horses. Will they be with us on the same ship, sir, or will be they be coming along later? Major Martin shifted his feet and looked down at his boots. He spoke softly as if he did not want to be heard. No, Sergeant, he said. I'm afraid the horses won't be coming with us at all. There was an audible muttering of protest from the parading soldiers. You mean, sir, said the sergeant, you mean that they'll be coming on a later ship? No, sergeant, said the major, slapping his side with a stick. I don't mean that. I mean exactly what I said. I mean they will not be coming with us at all. The horses will be staying in France. Here, sir, said the sergeant, but how can they stay, sir? Who'll be looking after them? We've got cases here that need attention all day and every day. The Major nodded. 
his eyes still looking at the ground. You're not going to like what I have to tell you, he said. I'm afraid a decision has been made to sell off many of the army's horses here in France. All the horses we have here are either sick or have been sick. It's not considered worthwhile to transport them back home. My orders are to hold a horse sale here in this courtyard tomorrow morning. A notice has been posted in neighboring towns to that effect. They are to be sold by auction. Auctioned off, sir. Our horses to be put under the hammer. After all they've been through, the sergeant spoke politely, but only just. But you know what that means, sir. You know what will happen. Yes, sergeant, said Major Martin. I know what will happen to them. But there's nothing anyone can do. We're in the army, sergeant. And I don't have to remind you that orders are orders. But you know what they'll go for, said Sergeant Thunder, barely disguising the disgust in his voice. There's thousands of our horses out here in France, sir. War veterans they are. Do you mean to say that after all they've been through, after all we've done looking after them, after all you've done, sir, that they're to end up like that? I can't believe they mean it, sir. Well, I'm afraid they do, said the Major stiffly. Some of them may end up as you suggest. I can't deny it, Sergeant. You've every right to be indignant, every right. I'm not too happy about it myself, as you can imagine. But by tomorrow, most of these horses will have been sold off, and we shall be moving out ourselves the day after. And you know, Sergeant, and I know, there's not a blessed thing I can do about it. Albert's voice rang out across the yard. What? All of them, sir? Every one of them? Even Joey that we brought back from the dead? Even him? Major Martin said nothing, but turned on his heel and walked away. 